Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Edina. Uh, Edina is a people's media house, we are based out of Bangalore. But the whole idea is to reinvent or rethink the idea of how to aggregate news from communities. So it's a community aggregated information. And in this process, we also try to get not just news from the community, but there are intellectuals and people who are thinking about what's happening to the society and the economy. We try to talk to them and understand what it means for us today and in the future. And in this regard, uh, before I introduce the guest, I would like to say that when I was studying economics, uh, one of the students asked one of our, my favorite profs, uh, that can we do economics without politics? Uh, he replied in a very beautiful way. He said, you can't write poetry if you don't know what love is. You can't do economics if you don't read politics. So somehow he said that uh, politics is integral to understanding economics. Budget is not just an economic tool, but it's also a political tool. So in this regard, uh, Parakala Prabhakar, whose essays on the Republic of Crisis is what we are going to discuss with him. Uh, he's a political economist uh, who will speak uh, about the, the politics of India and the economy around it. Uh, so uh, we'll break it up into two parts, two sessions. And the first session, uh, we will run through some of the questions and then continue uh, his analysis and what we should be looking to and do as we uh, archive the dissent, archive the crisis of our times. Welcome, uh, Prabhakshya sir. Very happy to have you here. And we'll take you through the journey of asking some questions about your background and also knowing where, where you come from and what is that you think India is going towards. So first and foremost, welcome to Edina. Thank you, Venkat. Yeah. Thank you very much. So before I start, I wanted to ask that the thoughts which were coming in my mind uh, yesterday evening was we have two wars going on. There are lots of problems in the supply side. Uh, there, are, there are oil shocks. Uh, it looks like Iran and Pakistan are going through a tough time. We have Maldives issue, we have unemployment issue, but somehow we have forgotten all of that. And suddenly we are talking about Ram Mandir, our prime minister has gone to multiple temples and all that the country is focused on is just the temple inauguration, as if there is nothing else. We seem to isolate ourselves. Uh, and in this context, your book has already spoken a few things. So uh, it'd be nice for you to introduce the current situation and the context of your book for us to take it forward. Uh, thank you, Venkat. Thank you for uh, having me. I think conversations like these are very important now, much more important than you know they ever were, probably. Um, we are in a very interesting phase of our national life, of our uh, collective life. You're talking about, uh, you know, we have a lot of problems, but then the focus for the last several weeks has been on the temple, the temple uh, uh, visits by the Prime Minister, and the temple inauguration, you know, bringing back uh, Ram Lala after nearly four centuries. This is the focus. Now, I have a feeling that India as a collective is in the process of a national numbing. A lot of things happening. As you said, there are wars happening in the world. There are um, different crises happening in the world. Um, oil, dollar, and, um, China versus United States, EU versus uh, United States, e EU versus China. Uh, problems in, in East Asia, problems in the Middle East, problems in uh, Europe, uh, problems in South America. And at home, closer, we have uh, a very serious unemployment problem. We have uh, very high inflation. We have uh, especially very desperate youth uh, both in terms of unemployment as, a, as well as unemployability, lack of uh, skills, uh, very poor sort of uh, education, um, squandering of a huge demographic dividend. All these are there, you know, closer home at our doorstep. But we are very concerned for a day or so, maybe for a couple of days. You know, when dollar was about to breach 80 rupees, 
there's a huge uproar in the country for a day. But then today, it's it's crossed, it's 83 rupees, but we just don't bother about it. When there was pandemic, when there were uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, migrant labor walking from, say, Kerala to Uttar Pradesh, Punjab to Uttar Pradesh, Kerala to Bihar, Tamil Nadu to Bihar, Andhra Pradesh to Bihar, um, you know, from different states and people walking, a uh, lot of people dying on the way. Um, the government not really bothered about it. And all of us stood on the roads and gave them biscuits and water. And, you know, hundreds of bodies floated on the river Ganges. But after that, we forgot about it. Unemployment we forget. Dollar we forget. You know, if there's a lynching for a day, there's an uproar. After that, we forget. Um, convicts are released. There was some kind of a stir for a day, and after that we forget. Um, and then we focus on these things, like the temple, Maldives tourism, Maldives versus Lakshadweep. And then, of course, you know, I don't want to go into the trivialities of uh, you know, films and film artists and, you know, their uh, doings and non-doings and all that. I don't want to go into But, you know, even, even if you look at, uh, uh, you know, apparently serious issues, they are also not the real issues. Now, you had, if you remember, Venkat, uh, I think sometime around the beginning of 2022, you had a huge rioting and unrest in UP and Bihar about uh, railway recruitment. You know, for just for 35,000 jobs, there were more than 1.25 crore applicants. And there was, you know, jostling, there was pushing, there was rioting, there was unrest, there was shouting and all that. You can imagine the kind of magnitude of the crisis in the employment and unemployment situation in the country. Um, but you know, all that is uh, shoved aside, then our focus is now on the mandir. I think it is, it is precisely these, the purpose of this entire thing is the distraction. You know, there is, a, there is this famous thing in the, in, the, in the magic industry. When the magician wants to do a slate of hand, he diverts your attention to something else. When you are looking at that, you know, this slate of hand happens. This is exactly what is happening in India today. Yeah. And in this regard, uh, archiving what dissent we have, what we think is going wrong with our country is important. And in this regard, what made you feel that the things which you've written You've changed, but put them all together in a structural way. What made you do that? Is it the economist, is it the politician, or is it just the dissenter in you? How would you say what brought you to bring it all together? I must tell you this, Venkat, uh, that what I said in the book is nothing new. You, everybody knew what I said. The only thing that I have done is that, you know, people are looking at each of them as a disconnected thing. What I thought should be done is to bring them all together and arrange them in a pattern and show that, you know, these things are happening one after the other, following a pattern. And there is a connection between these, what are happen what's happening. All of them, you know, they fall into a particular narrative. All of them fall into a particular pattern. And we need to understand what is that pattern. And if this trajectory continues, where is it going to lead our country to? What is going to happen to our, you know, foundational ideas of secular, liberal, plural, tolerant, democratic, federal republic that, have, that we have created. And you know, we have not created this just out of the blue. 
you know we have created this because those values have informed our long struggle for independence from the colonial domination you know it's a culmination of that and on those values we have founded a republic and today those values are jettisoned they are thrown and they are shown to be alien concepts they are shown to be against the grain of this land by whom by is this is very interesting by those platforms and political forces which played no role whatsoever in this long struggle for india's freedom but what is surprising in new india today is that those platforms and political forces which have not played even a tiny bit of role in this long struggle for india's freedom are marketing themselves as patriots that's yeah uh, you explained very well that how uh, the trajectory which we led us to the create the republic is being tarnished uh, I, there were many topics in the book i'll pick up two uh, slightly different but both economic ones and uh, want to hear from you how you look at it and what also understand if there is a, if there was a rational for it or in fact there was no rational to it too uh, one is the demonetization itself we did a lot of tom tom around it and then we don't really talk about it now the other one is the gst which is both economic but also very political it takes away the federal structure and the way it has been designed uh, but is, there is some celebration about the efficiency because every time we keep saying we're collecting more and more gst uh, i would like to get your views about these two <coughs> events which happened uh, in the modi era uh, and what do we think or do we think there is a framework to of doing all of this or they are just latching to it or there is no framework what's your view about these two and what does it mean for our economy um you see as far as the present government is concerned and the present ruling party is concerned my feeling is that they have no cohesive coherent economic thought this is something which is uh, uh which is really an issue that should bother uh, the entire uh, country especially those people who look at the country's economy where it is going and how it should go and all that. you know look at uh, look at uh, the 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 previous incarnation of this uh, present uh, ruling party the previous incarnation of the present ruling party used to bat for uh, free trade you know liberal economy and all that and the present incarnation started its journey in 1980 by announcing its core economic philosophy as gandhian socialism and nobody knows when that was uh, you know shed or when that was really buried everybody forgot about it and that collection that platform had tooth and nail opposed the 1991 liberalization look at the contradictions yeah. and this political party also opposed the gst okay. today they are the biggest champions of that they opposed privatization today they are champions of that they opposed liberalization today they are the champions of that so which means i'm i'm not saying that you know there is there is no room for change of heart there, there could be very uh, uh, a lot of room for that but my point is that they do not have to have a change of heart because there is no coherent thought at all if there were there was a belief in this particular system then you have a change of heart and go to a different system or you have evolved your own system but that's not the case now look at uh, look at demonetization which you mentioned and of course i'll come to uh, gst2 on that um you know they they have absolutely no idea it seems 
about the nature of black money. Black money is not in cash, Venkat, unless you've taken the bribe yesterday or day before and you did not have time to, you know, buy land or gold or, you know, uh, real estate or flats or something like that, you know. Yes. It, it doesn't stay in the form of cash. But they didn't realize that, they didn't understand that. Because as I call in my book and my essays, because, you see, the, the, the government and the ruling dispensation is full of voodoo economists. They have no idea. You know, they, they have no idea of the difference between microeconomy and the macroeconomy. National economy is different from a firm's economy. Now, I'll, I'll give you a very, very rudimentary example. Now, if a, if a firm is making losses, at that level what you do is you shed jobs, you cut down the costs. So that, you know, it, it, from, from red it comes to, you know, green. But if you do that in a macroeconomic situation, every firm sheds jobs, employment falls, incomes fall, and purchasing power collapses, and the economy goes into a downward spiral. So there is a lot of, you know, you can save a, a, a firm by cutting jobs, but you can't save an economy by, by cutting jobs, isn't it? So it, 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 the scale is different, but our mandarins in the government, they have absolutely no clue. So much so, when the, during the pandemic, the, the, the crisis had demand side problem as the basis, they started implementing stimulus package addressed to the supply side. You know, that is the kind of ignorance that you have uh, in this country and in this uh, ruling dispensation today. Um, you know, the, 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 if in, instead of addressing the, the, the employment situation, they're addressing the production situation. Now, you, you can't employ people when there is massive unemployment, especially the youth unemployment. We are in the company of uh, Iran, Lebanon, you know, you know that kind of uh, uh, economies which are in war situation and, you know, tatters. And our neighbor, the small neighbor like Bangladesh, has only half of what is our youth unemployment. We are 24 and they are just 12. You know, this is the crisis we have let into. Now, demonetization is brought in. The rural economy, the informal sector has, has been completely decimated. And it has not recovered even today. It has not recovered even today. And mind you, Venkat, when we brought in demonetization, already the Indian economy was slowing down. It was not in the recession, all right, but it was slowing down. So, uh, and, and then immediately we had pandemic. And we went to minus 22, minus 23 a, a quarter. You know, and even today your domestic uh, savings has uh, contracted. Your uh, domestic uh, uh, capital formation investment has, has, has plummeted. Savings is plummeted, uh, investment is plummeted, you know, it's a massive uh, outflow of uh, uh, capital uh, from this country. And you have uh, a huge number of HNIs especially relinquishing Indian citizenship and going into the, you know, Gulf countries or the Eastern, uh, East Asian countries, etc. They're, they're just going away. Now, the point is this, come what, whatever may be the, the public pronouncements of the captains of industry in India, I mean, because of, you know, they didn't want to sound hostile to the government, they were afraid or they didn't want to be polite or whatever the reason. But the, you know, they are voting with their feet. They're going away. They're, they're either going away or they're not investing. What does it mean? It, it means that the domestic en environment for investment is not conducive. That, that is the thing that we... Now, Let's come to GST. See, whatever you have in mind, but ours is conceived as a federal republic, both in terms of our political relations as well as in terms of our financial relations. Now, very recently, sometime a few days ago, you had an interview by the former uh, uh, CEO of uh, Niti Aayog and you know who played an important role in the Prime Minister's office and you know other uh, 
saying that the prime minister actually wanted the, the, the finance commission to cut down the resources that are to be devolved to the states. Look at that. And, and, and this is the thinking, you see. Um, GST, what does it do? It, it deprives the states of sources of revenue. Now, it has to look to the center. And, and you know, already we have, a, we have a very inequitable kind of a uh, uh, situation. In, in some states, they pay one rupee to the central pool and they might get, get about 23, 23, 25 or 33 paisa out of it. And some states pay one rupee, get two rupees, two rupees, 50 paisa. You know, that is the kind of a thing. And, you know, in this kind of situation, the ruling party at the center can play favorites. And the state's own resources, own ability to collect resources, to tax, is being slowly eroded. And so the federal spirit is being eroded, both in terms of politics as well as economy. Both in terms of the state's right to make decisions as well as states' rights to collect taxes and spend their own money. They have to look for That is why you have this slogan of double engine sarkar. You know, you elect us also in the state, you'll get it. Otherwise, you know, be careful. You'll be deprived of it. You'll be, you, you, you'll be punished for it. So the states which do not belong to the ruling party which is at the center are left high and dry. This is the kind, that is the reason, you know, uh, initially you started uh, with this uh, point, you raised this point of, you know, what's the connection between economy and polity? This is the connection between economy and polity. You cannot have economy without talking about the polity. You cannot have a politics, polity and politics without talking about the economy. They, both of them cannot live in isolation from each other. They are very, very closely and organically connected. So, when you said that the money which we give to the center and what they get back, South, because of its progress, specifically on the demographic side, is seem to be not benefiting from it. Do you see that friction increasing over the next few years? Would it become an important topic in 2024 election? Uh, or do you see that that will not work so quickly unless we tell people what it means? Uh, to not have this federal structure sustained or retained. You see, I do not, I do not, I, I do not have uh, any tools to predict what's going to happen. You know, uh, a couple of years from now, or maybe ten years from now. But you see, if if what is happening today continues to happen in the next five to ten years, I think there are going to be a lot of schisms in the in the in the country. The federal structure is already strained. Mm. strained you know it, it it is it is getting more and more stressed um, now it is you know uh, the ruling party at the center and another ruling another party which is ruling at the states probably but eventually eventually it could be between irrespective of political parties it could be between center and the states um, and is it inevitable? Well, if this trend continues, then it, it is going to be much more serious, much more stressful to the Federation of India. As it is, as it is, Federation is undermined for all practical purposes, just in the name. I mean, every institution for that matter, uh, Venkat. Look at Parliament. I mean, you can you can you imagine that a government, uh, a treasury benches, would, a, you know, send out about 140 to 150 members of Parliament, elected people, throw them out, and then pass legislation. Another thing I'll tell you what, and this is related both to the economy as well as to the polity, uh, to the economy and to our democracy to the economy and to our parliamentary democracy. What this is, what the farm laws. 
farm laws, I am not debating the merits and uh, demerits of farm laws. Probably they are good, we do not know. Probably they are bad, we do not know. Let us talk about that. I have an idea, but this is not the context for that. The point is this. Uh, three laws addressing the largest sector in India, you know, which spans the entire breadth and uh, uh, you know, depth of uh, the, the economy and the country, length of the country, every way, which directly or indirectly supports the largest segment of our population, that is the farm sector. Now, you brought in three laws and passed them with no discussion and there was an agitation against those laws and you went on branding those people who opposed these laws as Naxals, urban Naxals, anti-nationals, anti-BJP, anti-Prime Minister, anti-Modi, anti-this, anti-that, agents of uh, foreign governments, you know, all that kind of a thing. Which means that you, you really wanted them to be in place. Just before, a, a few days before the Punjab elections, the Prime Minister goes on to the television and announces that they are going to take them back. They are going to withdraw them. And then what happens? The parliament is convened and these three acts, laws, were withdrawn without a discussion. So laws were made without discussion. Economic laws were made without discussion and has huge political implications because you know it, it, is, it is the length and breadth of India is, is that, a large part of it. And agitation was opposed by the government and they withdrawn, withdrawn without discussion. So this is the kind of, you know, econo economic decisions related to the economy, laws related to economy were made, unmade without discussion. And you have people who are, who are talking about, you know, um, unheard of terms unheard of language in, in our 70 years of independence, parliament has not heard that kind of a language, but about a, a member talking about the other member. You know, that kind of an othering is happening in, 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 in parliament. So, uh, you know, if you look at the, the, the interrelation between economy, when this government uh, talks about it, when this government in, uh, brings in laws for, for, for a large sector, and where is the political voice? Where is the voice of the representatives? And you know, Venkat, as you know very well, democracy is not going out and voting once in five years. Democracy is a government by discussion, government by conversation, government by listening. This government doesn't listen, this government doesn't talk, this government does it allow discussion. We do not know why they make a law. We do not know why they withdraw a law. This is the kind of new India that we are living in today. Matashto Vishesha video Galanu Nodalu, Matu Hosa video Galabagatilu, Edina.com YouTube channel subscribe Madi, Matu bell icon click Madi.